Yeah. Yes. Uh, welcome, Halin, ma'am, and Mr. Anjia, sir. I request both of you to kindly check your audio and video connection. Now, all the dignitaries were joined, so we will uh, start the program very soon. So, kindly check your audio and video connection, please. Good evening, Dr. Balu. Yeah, good evening. You are audible, uh, but not visible, Mr. Anjia, sir. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you, sir. Yeah. Now, you are Sorry. audible and visible. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Halim, ma'am. Uh, please on your mic. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Happy to see you. My colleague Dennis is there as well. I can see yeah, Dennis. Yeah, he already joined. Hi, Dennis. Has Chitra joined, Dennis? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, okay. I'll just pay. So, Dr. Balu, I just wanted to check something with you. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for if you want to share the presentation, uh, because this is uh, disabled, this. Uh, yeah, Stay content. Just, just a minute, ma'am. I'll uh, give a privilege to you as a presenter, yeah. then you can share. Yeah, okay. Give it, give the privilege to uh, Dennis and me both. Just uh, as a setup. In case uh, simultaneously, well, only one person can be a presenter at a time. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, another thing I wanted to point out before we start uh, that, uh, you know, when you uh, our sessions are not divided into uh, two separate sessions like that. Okay. One presentation. So you start by calling out to me. I'll sure. hand over and request uh, Dennis to join at the slides where he has to join. And then he'll hand back to me. But the presentation is only one PPT number, only one PPT, right? Only one PPT. Should I email it to you or should I share it myself? Uh, you will give me the privilege. I'll share it myself. Sure, sure. I'm giving you the privilege. Okay, okay. Yes, now you are the presenter. Mm -hmm. uh, you can check, check it if you check. want. Yeah, I'll just check it. I'll just check it. Yes. On the bottom, there is your option for yeah. share. Yes, yes, yeah. I saw that. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. All right. So should I stop sharing now? It's yeah, now you can stop. Now you can stop. Oh, okay. So how do I? Ah, okay. Yeah, it's done. Man. It's done. All right. Yeah. Now all the panelists and dignitaries were also joined. Uh, Professor Jacinta, ma'am, are you available? Shall we begin the program now? Professor Jacinta, principal. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, Professor Santosh, sir, may I start the program now? Hi. Santosh, sir, you are not sir. audible. Your mic is on, but I couldn't listen to you. Am I not audible? Yeah, now Audit audible. Just... Now audible. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you, sir. Oh. Nice to see you. Sir. Yes. Uh, very good evening to all the dignitaries and the panelists. Uh, this is the webinar on uh, helpline and protecting children during COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, jointly, 
organized by child centric diora center in association with childline foundation and also with uh, stella mary's college vijaywada so just let me give a brief background about this webinar as you all aware this uh, covid 19 is an unprecedented situation and uh, the children were suffering a lot and especially the violence against children and the number of child marriages child labor dropouts were also being increased and this child line has played a very crucial role during this covid 19 to protect the children from this uh, pandemic issues and uh, the purpose of organizing this webinar is uh, first of all to create awareness about this child helpline and understand the activities and functions and we also have a NSS volunteers and NCC volunteers from the various colleges and uh, institutions, especially from the uh, Mary Stella College. And uh, they also will get awareness about what is their role in protecting children and how to effectively utilize this uh, child help plan. So with this uh, brief background, now I may invite uh, uh, Professor Jacinda, Principal, Mary Stella College to deliver a welcome address. Over to you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Balu. Good afternoon. Greetings and warm welcome to the webinar on helplines for protection of children during COVID-19 pandemic. We have here with us our patron Major General M.K. Bindal, Executive Director, NIDM, Dr. Anjaya Pandiri, Execu Executive Director, Child and India Foundation, Professor Santosh Kumar, Project Director, CCDRR, NIDM. Our distinguished speakers, Ms. Herlin Walia, Deputy Director, and Ms. Head, Child and Contact Center, Child, Dr. Balu, CCDRR Center, NIDM. Ms. Chitra Kalacharya, Head of Services, Child and India Foundation. I am head of the Department of Social Work, Maristella College, the coordinators of the webinar. We have here our students from Maristella College. On behalf of the joint organizers, Child and India Foundation and Maristella College, Vijayawada. I'm sorry, August you, August you, may your, you may turn off your video because I think there is some network issue with you. Your voice is breaking. Kindly turn off your video, please. And please continue. Okay. Yes, you may wonder about the purpose and timing of this. Am I audible, Dr. Balu? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Okay. You may wonder about the purpose and the timing of this webinar. Don't need to remind you of the havoc the pandemic has wrought at all levels, personal as well as societal. It has touched the young and old, men and women, rich and poor. But as it often happens, adverse conditions affect some sections more than others. In this current situation too, women and children are impacted more than men and children more than women. This is so because the fundamental condition of childhood is powerlessness. In the words of Nelson Mandela, Safety and security don't just happen. They are the result of collective consensus and public investment. We owe our children, the most vulnerable citizens in our society, a life free of violence and fear. He could well have been speaking of our world today. We have all read that all over the world, the pandemic has escalated cases of domestic violence, most often directed at partners or children. Isolation and containment have only aggravated situations of children who are already exposed to abusive, neglectful, 
and unsupportive environments. The pandemic may have also put out of reach. In many cases, children's sources of support outside of the family. In other words, it has shut in children while shutting out their helplines. It has compromised their access to social, educational and health provisions. It is this situation that this webinar seeks to address. It is a timely and much needed move to create awareness on child helplines among adolescent volunteers, the functions of such helplines and the impact of COVID-19 on children and the role of helplines. This is in the interest of protecting and promoting their physical and psychological well-being. Let us remember that there are only two lasting requests we can hope to give our children. One of these is roots and the other wings. Whatever the conditions, we must strive as adults to give them these. Welcome once again. Maristella is happy to be co-organizers of this extremely relevant webinar. Thank you and God bless. Uh, thank you, Professor Jacinda, ma'am, for a warm welcome and also <laughs> highlighting the issues of uh, children. Uh, now uh, I may uh, invite Professor Santosh Kumar, sir, who is the uh, Professor and Head for Child Centric Disaster Risk Reduction Center and also Governance Inclusive DRR Center. He was also a former direct executive director of National Institute of Disaster Management and director for SARC Disaster Management Center. And he has an international level exposure. With this brief background, now I may invite Professor Santosh sir to deliver an opening remarks. Sir, for your kind information, we had almost 800 candidates were registered, but uh, due to some technical issue, they were not able to join. As of now, we have 150. Over to you, Professor Santos, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balu. Uh, am I audible, Balu? Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, now, all the dignitaries and uh, especially Madam Jacinta Kadri uh, and uh, other colleagues uh, who have joined from three different institutions, all the esteemed panelists, uh, our partners, uh, this is uh, kind of a kind of what we say that is a very, very uh, timely organized uh, webinar by the Child Centric DRR National Institute of Disaster Management. I am happy to note that uh, three institutions have joined today and uh, they all have thought about this as a kind of uh, importance about the subject and child helpline is already into it. So they uh, know the issues and uh, what kind of a challenges in the field which is happening due to COVID-19. Importantly, that I won't be speaking much because a large number of speakers are there. Uh, uh, Madam uh, would be there. Uh, um, uh, Helena Walia is there. Ms. Dennis is there. Mr. Dennis is there. Uh, then uh, Anjan Pandre is there. Uh, and also Chitra Kacharya is there. So, in this kind of a uh, uh, galaxy of speakers, I would just uh, say a couple of things. One that I would like to hearty welcome all of you on this particular occasion that we were discussing uh, issues related to children in the context of third wave and uh, how uh, we can think of uh, providing this helpline at the time of emergency. So this is one very, very important as we have seen in the wave two uh, wave two that uh, everywhere hue and cry people were finding informal sources of information and uh, they were looking into those who were looking for oxygen, somebody looking for medicine, somebody were looking for beds and so on and so forth. And this time we say that uh, pandemic uh, is likely to be, it is said by the experts. I'm not saying that it is my point of view, but these experts which they are saying that this pandemic is going for the non-vaccinated uh, uh, people, number one, which is the large, uh, the most vulnerable. And the second is that uh, uh, 
those children who are uh, not eligible for vaccination. So this is number two. And then uh, number three uh, possibly uh, would be uh, just taken one dose. And uh, number fourth uh, could be of uh, uh, those who are not wearing mask at all and not taken any medicine, uh, not taken any kind of a uh, vaccination. So, uh, and all these would multiply many fold uh, kind of a challenges uh, for the children who are not vaccinated or they are not eligible for vaccination. So, how that uh, kind of uh, the, if you do this uh, kind of a quantification of likelihood of uh, affected children, uh, the number would be quite huge, and uh, and all the spectrum of the children like uh, poor people, families, and also that uh, middle class families and those who are living in these quarters and everywhere. So, <clears throat> how we are going to address uh, uh, this uh, helpline need uh, whenever the emergency occurs? So how to monitor those, keep monitoring those households where the, we can find out there's a most vulnerable areas, then there's uh, priority by the second vulnerable area or the third vulnerable area. It's very difficult, uh, although uh, taking this uh, clue from the past two, uh, that uh, wave one and the wave two, uh, we are not in a conclusive statement. We can say that X area will be affected and Y area will not be affected. So uh, when we start mapping and uh, doing the hazard donation, and we do it, uh, does which area is much more vulnerable for uh, uh, this uh, kind of a pandemic, or which area is not? Uh, some uh, parameters are there, and uh, but the analysis is still to come. Many people are doing it. Whether it's coming, most of the cases are coming from the quarters. Most of the cases are coming from the urban areas, or maybe the third is the high density area or this is coming of the area where people are flouting the rules and regulations there from there it is coming we do not know exactly that uh, how uh, uh, at the hospital level and uh, when the patient level we do not know uh, in that uh, during that time but from where these uh, patients are coming but the idea is to start monitoring develop monitoring mechanism so that uh, helpline like you have the dedicated number also and then how these can be very very effective with the parents that children uh, probably will not be able to use this and uh, some children may be uh, those who are 17 and 18 years of old they might be but those who are into a kind of a uh, very very uh, into uh, the uh, adolescence or maybe that uh, kind of a zero to six years or five years is very very vulnerable so how their parents are given such kind of a support system so that they can exit as and when they require so these are the things which I wanted to flag with the uh, galaxy, galaxies of experts here. And they can guide us, the CCDRR and NIDM, that we have been doing webinars and workshops, uh, that how that uh, these information should reach to them, what are the recommendations we can give for the preparedness, and what are the recommendations which we can give for the risk reduction. So all those, and we say that the uh, Dabai bhi or Kadai bhi. So that is there, but the Dabai has not been able to reach to everyone. So the only source is that if there is Dubai is fine, there is no Dubai, then their Kadai is the only solution which probably we uh, can live with. But once Dubai and Kadai is there, and but despite this that people are falling and uh, sick, then probably then we need to look at our services. And that services is uh, very much needed from information A to information Z. So in the case of whole supply chain management, whether the oxygen, the medicine, the bed, the hospital, the hospital care, the doc, the doctors, the nursing, and everyone. So how uh, from starting from the phone given to those and then ambulance to uh, coming back home, that kind of a treatment uh, from A to Z, that's what I said that A to Z services available for the children, are especially focusing on the children's need. Uh, children ambulance require different kind of a mobility, different kind of a, uh, their designs are different, not the same as the adults uh, ambulance. So that is another thing. Then how that oxygen support system will also be different with the, for the children uh, than uh, the other. So how collectively we can think of and uh, time is not much before us. So what we are saying is that uh, uh, in the least uh, time, how we can give the maximum output uh, so that uh, our uh, society can feel confident and how we can extend this hand to the concerned state government and the local government at the time of handling crisis. 
So this is very, very important that how civil society institutions and the people uh, like us that are the professionals institution like NIDM, CRI and all these, our uh, partner organization can work together and act together and especially deliver together. That is much more important. So with these words, I would uh, compliment my team, Dr. Raka, Dr. Balu, Mr. Ranjan, uh, Dr. Vartika, and also Ms. Dolphy. This is my team, but uh, the galaxy of the team which are available from these two organizations. I'm indeed really grateful. And on behalf of Major General Manoj Marbindal and on behalf of National Institute of Disaster Management, CCDR, I extend my heartfelt thanks and welcome to all of you and all those distinguished delegates who have joined uh, as a participants. Uh, I would request or urge you to ask as many questions you have in your mind with these experts because this is an opportunity that they are with us. And after that, then we will keep uh, 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 trying to find out at the time of crisis, then you won't get it. So idea is to uh, get the number, get the uh, questions uh, uh, kind of answered by these experts so that at the time of crisis, you feel confident that they are there in the backup if anything goes wrong. So once again, uh, uh, on my personal behalf, I extend my heartfelt thanks to all of you, to the both the institutions, all the resource persons. My, I'm really indebted to all of you that you have joined hands with the National Institute of Disaster Management, Child Centric DRR. Thank you all, and uh, I really thank you very much uh, once again. To over to you, Dr. Rakan, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, thank you, Professor Santos, sir, for a, such an insightful address and highlighting the various issues of children during this pandemic, and also for your kind wishes. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us. And now uh, I may invite uh, Mr. Uh, Ancheria Pantria, who is the Executive Director of Childline India Foundation. I welcome him uh, to deliver an inaugural address. Over to you, Mr. Ancheria. Uh, thank you, Balu. Thank you, Dr. Balu. So, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, you know, for inviting us on this platform. Uh, it's a great privilege to me and as well as my colleagues to share our experiences, what we are exactly doing that will come in the kind of latter stage. Uh, to start that, I would like to say, respected uh, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, Executive Director, NIDM. Respected Professor Santosh Kumar, Professor and Head of the Department, Governance Inclusive, Disaster Risk Reduction, Child Centered Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, uh, I met uh, Professor Santosh Kumar uh, during the JNU conference where uh, we were together. So thank you, sir, for this opportunity once again. Uh, thank you very I much. Uh, to... Sorry, I, Anjia, Doctor. Thank you very much and a hearty welcome to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank so, you. Uh, Dr. Jacinta, uh, sister, uh, sister uh, principal, Mary Stella College, Vijayawada. Uh, Dr. Balu, CCDRL, NIDM, and my colleague uh, Chitra, Head Services, Child and India Foundation, and Sister Sahaya, HOD Social Work, Stella Mary College. Uh, my colleagues, uh, senior colleagues, Arlene, Deputy Director, Child and India Foundation and also Dennis, head uh, Child and Contact Center, Child and India Foundation, and all my friends uh, and uh, colleagues and uh, uh, for this, uh, who is attending this. So thank you very much uh, for all of you. And at this outset, I, I would like to congratulate uh, for this uh, webinar on helplines for protection of the children during the COVID-19 pandemic, call for action. I think this is a very important theme we have taken up and uh, it's a timely also. And uh, since uh, we are all uh, anticipating and predictions are there that a third wave is also going to come and uh, primarily it is going to impact children uh, all the more. So this is, I think, uh, some sort of preparedness, some sort of uh, engagement awareness is very, very essential. I thank you for this and uh, this is a wonderful, uh, uh, timely, you know, held, uh, timely happening uh, webinar. As uh, already uh, told that um, 
sister uh, Jacinta and uh, Professor Santosh Kumar already emphasized, and we all experienced uh, COVID-19 pandemic has uh, led to a dramatic loss of human lives and uh, economic destruction, loss of livelihoods, and uh, it challenged the public health system, and particularly during the second wave. We are all uh, experienced practically. So it's uh, at every level, each uh, segment of the population has experienced dramatically this uh, whole situation during this uh, phase one, the wave one and wave two. Uh, indeed, uh, pandemic has pushed people to an uh, extreme poverty if you look at a kind of economic perspective. Lockdown also serious implications on mental health, both uh, all kinds of people. It's a particularly children and women and including this frustration, stress and depression. We know all that. Uh, we all know that uh, our country has a kind of 40 percent of the child population. And during this pandemic, particularly since we run the child helpline, we have experienced and we understand and the difficulties faced by children across the country. During this pandemic, children are uh, experiencing uh, a, 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 a deep you know, fear and anxiety, uh, inattention as for the studies are concerned and other problems due to the close, you know, closed down of the schools. It is a, there is no playgrounds. There is no chance for the children to play around. So there is no chance to children for uh, interact with each other and the families are, you know, completely locked down and the parents are busy with their own day-to-day uh, uh, -day works and the jobs. And there is a fear of insecurity, fear of, fear of uncertainty. This all also impacted directly or indirectly on the children in a great deal. So the incidents of, as far as we are coming to, we are, we are concerned, we experience and we work with the kind of most uh, marginal children across the country. And the incidents we, in our experience, uh, my colleagues are going to give in a detailed, uh, you know, understanding about the scenario that uh, ha that has been happening uh, all around for the last 15 months. But the incidents of certainly the incidents of child abuse, child marriages, child labor, and uh, begging, trafficking, these are the, some of the issues and some of the problems, you know, really increased and uh, lost, uh, you know, children have lost uh, interest in studies also. And online safety issues, the cyber crimes have increased and children mostly who are just, you know, access the, you know, Android phones, smartphones, and they are also subjected to prone to kind of online safety issues. So that has also resulted in a kind of lot of traumatization among the many children and that has been reported to uh, various uh, helplines. And the one more, during this uh, second wave, the serious concerns we have been facing that many children have become orphans and uh, abandoned because of the due to loss of uh, single parent or both the parents. Nearly we have a kind of uh, a great loss. We have about uh, the official data says that around 30 to 35, you know, children have become, uh, you know, orphaned due to the children's, you know, the parents loss. I think this is a serious issue and uh, uh, we will be uh, talking about that in detail. Chailen, as you all know that uh, my uh, Chailen is at Chailen 1098 service, India's 24 into 7 toll free helpline exclusive for children in distress, particularly children in distress and who needs care and protection. Chailen is the uh, one of the world's uh, largest uh, network providing emergency outreach services uh, children who are, you know, for the children who are in distress. And uh, we are happy to say that Child and 1098 uh, services in this country uh, just completed 25 years in June uh, 2021. So we have been serving uh, through this helpline for last 25 years and particularly, you know, children who are in a kind of, uh, children of the marginalized communities you know, the children from the poverty uh, groups. Child and 1098 services is statutory services and uh, it operates within the framework of the Juvenile Justice uh, Care and Protection of Children's Act 2015. And uh, so this is the kind of in a very brief and uh, so you're going to have a very good presentations and uh, a very detailed understanding details of the, the child protection issues. What are the kind of child protection issues we are uh, confronting today? and how we are responding, how the not only child helpline, but many other stakeholders, including the various state government and central governments and where the other civil society organizations all together, how we are trying to respond to this uh, uh, the crisis 
and uh, the crisis is not ended. We need to now have a strong, uh, in a very, very well placed uh, preparedness plan as for the children are concerned. And it is a timely since uh, NIDM is a kind of one of the very, very important, uh, the key primary stakeholders in terms of, uh, you know, responding to the disaster uh, uh, issues across the country. I think uh, this will, uh, this seminar will give some idea and also it will help us to again come together and uh, have a kind of a very good uh, child, uh, you know, child disaster preparedness plan in the country as a whole. So I thank you, uh, Dr. Balu and uh, all others, uh, both the institutes uh, for uh, giving this opportunity for me and also to my all colleagues. So, so Dr. Balu, thank you very much for this opportunity once again. So um, I wish all the best for uh, this uh, seminar and I think certainly we are, uh, going to benefit from this, uh, the next, uh, you know, the one, one other hour. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Anjaya Pantriji for uh, highlighting the issues of children and also sharing the background of this helpline and your effective services during this pandemic. Thank you so much, sir, for joining with us. Uh, now, with the permission of all the dignitaries, let us move on to the technical session now. Uh, here we have uh, two eminent speakers with us today. Uh, let me just introduce the speakers and the stars of the today's program. Ms. Haleen Walia is the Deputy Director of Childline India Foundation, which anchors the 1098 Child Helpline, the only helpline exclusively for children in crisis in India. Brings to Childline the experiential understanding required for facilitating implementation and monitoring of a national partnership based on child protection service. Uh, she is skilled in policy analysis, capacity building, donor management, government relations, and civil society engagement. And her experience includes uh, that of being a UNICEF supporter, senior consultant for a child protection in the Ministry of Women and Child Development, a training and development specialist in the UN office, trucks and crime, a gender program officer in the Center for World Solidarity, and the psychological rehabilitation program coordinator for Sanglab India, where she started her journey in child protection and uh, Montessori teacher at Young Learner School, Kolkata, which she started with the founder. And uh, I also happy to uh, introduce our second speaker, Mr. Dennis, is the head of Childline Contact Center National 24 into 7 helpline for children in need of care and protection that responds to call made to 1098. Over two decades of work experience in operation management, team building, strategic implementation, and MIS system, work in corporate and NGO sector. Using technology to reach out to more number of target beneficiaries has been an arena of interest. Data analysis and reports that highlight the service impact that could further enable bridging down the gaps in services in another area of interest. With this brief introduction now, I may invite both the speakers to start the session. Uh, let me enable the presenter role to uh, Haleen. Yeah, over to you, Haleen, ma'am. Now you are the presenter. You may share your screen, please. Uh, please unmute yourself, ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Balu. I hope I'm audible now, loud and clear. Yes, please make it full screen. Play your PPT. Just a second, please. Yes. Thank you. So, uh, as mentioned earlier, thank you. Thank you very much uh, NIDM. Thank you uh, to all of you and to the, uh, to the to the specific desk, which has given us this opportunity to engage the CCDRR desk, which has given us this opportunity to engage uh, with your large network. Uh, we noticed in the brochure that there was a mention of NSS and NCC volunteers, which was of particular interest to Childline, considering it is youth groups and uh, peer groups 
who actually spread the message of 1098 far and wide. For today's uh, webinar, Dennis and I will be dividing our uh, time and the information and sharing it with you. But there is uh, only one presentation which is going to be shared and based on that, uh, both Dennis and I will be speaking. As our executive director mentioned earlier, so what we bring to share with you is the experience of 1098, the experience of Childline 1098. The Child Helpline in India has a name. It's called Childline 1098, and it has been in existence for the last 25 years. So what we want to share with you is that journey. The reason why we are stressing on sharing of a journey rather than the last one year is because from day one to now, Childline has always known what its critical role is, which is to be an emergency response mechanism for children in distress. Last year's uh, events, incidents, tsunami of sort, uh, which is what the pandemic was, the health tsunami of, of, of a sort, that that whole year right up to now with all the subsequent waves was a new experience for the entire world. For Childline, it was just one more experience in this 25 years of being in service. Uh, on this note, I would like to hand the discussion over to my colleague, Dennis Rodericks, who heads the Childline Contact Center, where the calls to 1098 land. And after, uh, over to you, Dennis. Thanks, Arneem. Uh, a very good evening to all of you. So, uh, in my presentation, basically, we would be sharing with you, as Arneem mentioned, about Childline, the journey of what Childline is, what Childline, the way in which it operates. And then I would be touching upon the Childline Contact Center operations and the technology part of it. So to begin with, uh, we'll start with the Childline views. Uh, again, I think we'll have to move on to the next slide, please. Childline 1098, India's safety net for children. What happens is a concerned adult on behalf of the child or the child himself or herself can call on the number 1098. It's free for the caller. Now, when a person dials the number 1098, it comes to a contact center. After the call comes here, there are there is a team basically who answers this call. It is to be noted that we don't use IVR. That being an emergency service, we feel that it is important that the voice which the children who call 1098 here is a human voice, somebody to listen to them. So here at the contact center, we primarily understand the requirement or the concern of the child. And if a physical intervention where the child needs to be met, we transfer this information to our partners at the local level. These partners, when the information is received, would rush to the child. The standard time, which we say minimum time to require reach the child would be 60 minutes. On reaching the child, our team member rescues the child, reports back to the contact center, and then our team at the ground, our intervention units, they would basically take care of the emergency intervention and link the child to long-term rehabilitation. So Childline 10 minute is basically a unique tele outreach model, which makes it unique in India. Yeah, hold him, please. So you would be happy to know that Childline is India's first and only 24 hour free emergency phone outreach service for children in need of care and protection. 
it was a commitment by the India government under the UNCRC. Childland model has inspired a service in many countries. Uh, some of the countries, our neighboring countries, the SAC countries, they also visited Childland India to see how the Childland model op operates. The PPP model, which is the private public partnership, the largest child production network in any one single country. Category one, basically the number means that irrespective of the service provider, it is mandatory for them to provide connectivity to us. So Chilean started in tests in 1996. Jaru Bilumoria, the founder of Childline, who was a faculty member of this, she used to, you know, uh, visit the railway stations at night times and everything. But this whole idea of having a service for children when they need the most was brought up to her. And sitting with them, understanding the requirement, the Childline model took some shape. So basically it's a partnership at many levels with child at the center. So the public private partnership between China India Foundation and Ministry of Women and Child Development. We also work with state and district administration because we believe that Chilean cannot work alone. So it's the networks of the network. That is what Chilean is all about a social franchise model, the largest child protection network in the country, technology for child protection. So here, what we are trying to do is reach out to the maximum number of children who are in need of parent protection by using technology. Our technology partners, Tata Consultancy Services, which you know, uh, not only in uh, national, but also at international level has an impact. So uh, the arrangement which we have with them, where the Chilean contact center operates from, is where the technology comes into picture. So we, I'll be talking about it in my following slides. So our vision is basically a child-friendly nation that guarantees the child right and protection of all children with a mission that we will reach out to every child in need of care and protection. We use the 4C model, which is basically connect, catalyze, collaborate, and communicate. So connecting, connecting with every child using technology is something which we practice. Catalyzing in the, term, in the terms of bringing change, identify the gaps in services, bridging those gaps, and being a catalyst where systems need to be further strengthened and to make better policy levels. Collaborate with stakeholders working towards creating a child-friendly society and for the country. So communicate, make child protection everybody's business. As I said, that it can, the, the success of Childline is basically we have taken along everybody with us and we have reached here to where we are right now. These are some case studies which are sometimes highlighted um, right from, you know, children who are trafficked to missing children, children are being physical abuse, sexual abuse. And we have a list long of case histories which we could share and there are uh, these case histories are also available on our website which one can refer to the childland model with the child at the center we have a childline advisory board the dcpu so what we have what happens over here they are basically instrumental in framing the policies of bridging down the gaps which are there 
for that particular district. So Childline basically takes the voices of the children, which we capture through the open houses. Open house is basically a forum where children could meet the Childline team and address their problems when they go for outreach or there are special uh, you know, open sessions conducted when sometimes children may say that you know they were trying to access our service, but for some reason they were not able to. So it also highlights and basically helps us to further improvise, further facilitate to make this service a better thing for the children. So then we have the resource organizations. Uh, these are basically um, units which we could refer our children to when we need assistance like uh, shelter homes or hospitals or you know uh, the other educational institutes where we can refer to children uh, which come to childline for assistance. Nodal organization is basically who has a very important role to play. It basically looks into the welfare and making sure that the service is operational. It also ensures that on the board of Childline Advisory Board, we have prominent members who could bring about change in the policy level, which would be from the police, from the hospital, from the institutes, so from the systems. So it helps to, you know, uh, facilitate the service, smoother functioning of the service. Support organizations and extension arm for Childline Intervention Unit. So uh, basically, if uh, the assistance has to be provided and it is uh, uh, a bit beyond the radius of the particular intervention unit from where the child is calling from, the cases are referred by the intervention unit to the support organizations. Of course, then the collaborative unit, this unit basically receives the call information which comes from CCC. So CCC and the collaborative unit work close hand to hand, ensure that the assistance is provided to the child. Yeah. Next, please. So scale of child and service, over 90 million calls answered till date, around 15,000 calls per day. This volume has slightly reduced because of the pandemic. Uh, then over 3 lakh children assisted directly every year. So when we, there are some children where we are counseling over the phone, but there are also children who are provided medical assistance and, uh, you know, rescue. So those are categorized by us as a direct intervention. Over 1100 children directly assisted every day. And we have a partner strength of around 826. So how does this childland system works basically? All calls dialed on 1098 come to the Childland Contact Center, which are spread across six locations. We don't use IVR as I mentioned. So once the call comes in, our CCOs will, our Childland Contact Officers, they will answer the call in the regional languages. Gauge what the child requirement is, or sometimes understand from the caller who is calling a concerned adult who is calling on behalf of the child. And once we receive this information, we classify, we document this at a central server. All the six locations are connected to the central server. And the documentation is online, which is accessible to the CCC team. Now, once the information is received and a child is found to uh, have a uh, support requirement. This information is then based on the location is either transferred to our districts or if it is from the railway child lines, it is the bus, bus terminals where also the 10 lines eight service has been started. So overall we have covered 81% district with around 1074 ground intervention units across every states and Union territory. To understand in whole what we do is the child the call comes at by the, uh, after the person dies on 1098. The CCC answers this call. 
Now, CCC has a time frame by which the call information has to go to our partner, which is which ranges from five to fifteen minutes max. The third part is where the child and team rushes to the child, meets the child, informs this, and this all once the case is registered, there is a case ID generated, there is an ATM which is expected from the team, the expected time of meeting. This is the coordination which constantly happens between the intervention unit and the child and contact center. Then our team at the ground level, they would take the child to the, uh, and produce the child before the child welfare committee. And based on the directions of the CWC, the child is provided shelter or is kept in the custody, safe custody and the case is closed. So immediate intervention and then linking the child to long-term rehabilitation is child and score work. Case management and documentation by IU is monitored by CIF program team, which basically looks and ensures that the service is provided at every district level and monitors them. So I'll just add here, Dennis, that just as the child life contact center can be found in six locations in the country, in five locations in six units. The program teams are based in four cities. So you have four regional resource centers of Childline India Foundation and a Childline Knowledge Hub where the program teams are uh, handholding of partners, uh, documentation, monitoring and capacity building is carried out. Over to you, Tens. Unfortunately, this this slide, please. Yeah, it hangs sometimes. Just give it a second. Or you could just move on, and I'll try and yeah, there you are. Dennis, you're on mute. Thailand India Foundation. The CCC part of it is the first voice response to 1098 calls, data management, data analysis, the report part. This is purely the core work business which happens at the child and contact center. And at the bottom, which we can see, the CIF program team has, and uh, CIF basically looks at the advocacy part, starting up with partner identifying the partners, training and capacity building, communication, funding, monitoring and evaluation, and telecom. So these are the broad areas which uh, happens at the national level and at the regional levels of China India Foundation. Our partners are the ones who provide direct intervention to the children, not only through the calls which are handed over to them, but also through outreach. Outreach is basically they would, they would go to different pockets of the city or district and would spread awareness about child land. At the same time, if, there is, if they come across children who would need assistance, like during COVID times, uh, our team at the ground level were instrumental in making sure that food assistance was provided to children. Medical assistance was given, and uh, like at the during the first wave of this COVID nineteen, there was a lot of panic. So you know, uh, orienting and confidence building among children was very much required. So the team at the child and contact center, the team, the team at the district level, were instrumental in making sure that children were given the required support. There were many children who were standstill at a particular position. So all these were challenges which one had encountered, especially during the first wave, and it still continues. Next one, please. So the types of assistance or the categories of children which we received are children who are abused, or there is violence, domestic violence, physical, sexual abuse children call us, and so it is some, uh, sometimes not easy. Children do not open up easily. 
they are equally susceptible to a person at the other end when the 1098 calls are being answered. So it takes a lot of confidence building. It's just not one call. There are sometimes multiple calls. The child calls up, disconnects, gathers some courage, calls up again. So you have to, one is to understand that you have to go with the space and speed at which the child is comfortable. And then gradually, but surely, we try our level best that the child speaks up. And there are successful stories as well, wherein we have been able to intervene and help the child. There are children who are unaways, children with disability, missing children. This is one area which we are further trying to strengthen this because, you know, uh, uh, the success rate at which we have to identify these children. We get information from the Missing Children uh, Bureau from the ministry and things like that. So, uh, Arun, just sort of one minute on the previous slide. Thanks. Then homeless children, children with child labor, trafficking, entitlements, substance abuse, health, education. And during this pandemic, we had children asking for food, children tracking, uh, asking for linking to services, especially children who had lost both their parents or children with single parent who lost them because of COVID. So Chilean was able to reach out to these children and provide them assistance. Yes. So now we go to the Chilean contact center, which uh, I had. The previous one was, is it? Yeah, thank you. So it's a 24 by 7 facility. The voice response to 1098 calls, interaction with child and partners, cases are documented, data analysis and reports. There are standard scripts. So we don't do any manual documentation at the child and contact center. There are scripts which come on the CRM, which are read by the child and contact officers, and the cases are documented. Intervention, non intervention. They are grouped and classified. And we use the BPO technology in uh, partnership with TCS. So things which are easily available in BPO industry, which is like the speed at which the calls are answered, the duration at which the call was, the peak hours, the lean hours. So this basically helps us to, you know, improvise on the effectiveness operations of the child and contact center. Then there is a special team who does the quality monitoring. This is a post record process basically, where there's a team who listens to calls. The job is to basically listen to calls and this, train, this is then inbuilt into our improvisation on uh, quality response. So trainings are given to our team members, which further enhances the quality of response. Training and capacity building of the team members uh, right throughout this pandemic. Uh, Childline contact center was functional. And uh, like any other center and like any other process, we also went through a lot of phases which Harleen would also discuss further. There was anxiety, there was nervousness. We didn't know what next because our technology was actually not built in line with this pandemic. Nobody thought about this. The preparation for this particular type of thing was not there. Yes, we had a process wherein if one system goes down or one location goes down, we can divert the calls to the other location and work could continue. So this is one of process which helped us because uh, being in the TCS process, uh, if few of our colleagues were tested positive, the entire operations had to be brought to a halt. But the child and service still continued. What we did was we transferred the calls which were received at that location to another location. For example, if say uh, calls in the north, the where our center is, contact center is in Gurgaon, which receives calls for the entire north belt, were transferred to west. We could manage with the Hindi speaking skills. So this was a constant 
uh, process which we did right throughout this pandemic made, made sure that the operations were on in the best possible efforts which Child India Foundation took with the help of the management and we ensured that the show was on. So five locations, 25 regional languages. We have 137 seats, uh, which are used 24 by 7 based on the call flow. Uh, we use the Genesis platform. There's a soft phone, uh, so hands are free and people can use the software. Uh, we have a CRM, which is a licensed software, basically, which we have taken from the company called Talisma, which is a Bangalore-based company. So uh, on average, we receive 130 to 150 calls per child and contact officer. Or this depends also on the skill set. And around 15 to 20 outbound calls are done. These calls are done by each CCO to the intervention units and mainly done when they have to hand over a case to the partners. So the system works where all the calls would land up as the central system and there are PRI lines, the primary rate interface, which basically distributes this call to different locations. So at any given point of time, each center is equipped with 60 lines which are used for incoming as well as the outgoing calls. There is a switch which is connected to a server. As I mentioned, all the CCCs, so all the contact centers, all the six locations are connected to a central server. And in case of the primary server fails for some reason, then we can move to a PR server, which is called as a disaster recovery server. And simultaneously, the calls get recorded. This is just a snapshot of a, a smart desk, which the officers use to dial a outbound call, also receive call. This gives you a view of uh, the, we are supervisors and we have the operation managers and the process in place, which gives you a view of how many people are answering calls, how many are taking follow-ups, what is the after call work time which they are taking. And in fact, there's also a barge in facility which, uh, you know, wherein the supervisors could listen to what the associates are talking with the caller or with the child. So, Harley, from you onwards, it's for you to take on. I want you to comment on this, Dennis, and then I'll take on. Okay. Uh, this is very close to my heart, actually. That's right. Because, uh, you know, uh, it's been a journey and it's been an experience actually to make sure that the operations were on during this pandemic. Uh, right from what would happen and uh, what about our, oh, the security of the team members and uh, how would we manage this huge pressure? And especially, you know, oh, we used to have butterflies in our stomach when we had our associates tested positive because that was a bigger challenge for us. And uh, so, and we had uh, in uh, Calcutta, we had our associates who left because there was discrimination. They were they, uh, the uh, Northeast associates whom we had, people started uh, treating them not from our process, but in their vicinity, people, uh, thought that, you know, this virus was brought from China. So they started, you know, uh, passing comments to the Northeast candidates and they had no option but to leave the place. And uh, our associates were tense because they said, no, we don't worry about ourselves. But if we, supposing if we carry this virus to our loved ones, what would happen? So we had to get ourselves together, get the entire strength and most importantly, the objective and the mission that is the child. So having this in mind, uh, taking the maximum precautions, what we could, right from the PP kits to uh, making sure that we had uh, operationally how well and uh, best we could protect our associates and keep the work. Uh, in fact, even if MTNL or BSNL lines through which we received 1098 calls, if there were some road constructions and the line broke up, 
uh, we actually depend then on BSNL to come and fix it. And we did not have support during the COVID. So, you know, uh, cajoling them to come and assist us and providing them all the uh, assistance so that the lines could be fixed. So, yes, uh, it's been a journey getting the team members uh, every alternative day for a core team which would work. So, in all, I think from the day one till date, we had around 58 people from our own team, from a staff strength of 300 plus, who at one point of time or another were tested positive. Right? Like, you no, know, some of our colleagues from CIF who actually took their personal vehicles to carry back the associates to the process because, you know, we needed transport. Even transport was not easily available. So, yes, Erlin, it's uh, been an experience and uh, I think we are now more prepared in terms of like, no, now COVID does not scare us actually. <laughs> All right. On that note, Dennis, I'll take over. So, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Once again, this has been our motto. Right from the time that the pandemic struck and Childline India Foundation and the Childline Network were transformed into a kind of war room uh, existence where every single day 24 7 from that day to now we have been uh, engaging with countering and actually turning challenges into opportunities uh, the pandemic uh, it was traumatic not just for one person but for everybody it was more for those who were most marginalized, most voiceless, most vulnerable. However, it was traumatic for all. And we at Childline use that trauma, use that experience to try and turn it into an opportunity so that we could help children better. Uh, when Dennis mentions not having transport, peculiar situation where the Childline contact centers were functioning in the Tata Consultancy service premises they give us the infrastructure we provide the people and the training so they function within the tcs premise and there was not a single person because the entire it sector had moved to a work from home situation there was no one there except the childline contact center personnel the cco who was there to receive that call from the child who is obviously not going to understand where people are or why they are scared they just want to talk they want help and that's what we were trying to provide so initially when the lockdown struck as dennis has mentioned we have a variety of calls coming some of those calls so number of calls some of those calls require us to transfer the call to the local intervention unit but there are many 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 situations which are dealt with on the phone itself we saw a huge spike in calls. We saw the call volume going up by almost 50%. We saw people, uh, you know, on a daily basis, there were 300 to 500 calls which were related only to COVID. And there was, there was complete panic where you had, uh, you know, uh, people calling for food, uh, children saying that you know, nobody else is picking up our phone, please help us, please help us. And this is, this is the kind of situation that we dealt with from, uh, you know, in the first 10 days, it was horrific because there was no end to those calls. After that, slowly, as information was disseminated, as, uh, you know, there was more uh, awareness regarding what was happening, as people got slowly used to lockdown and then the unlockdown or the opening up of lockdown in phases, those information calls plateaued and reduced. But we saw a huge spike in the first phase that has prepared us because even now as the second wave struck i think we were more prepared than last year though the volume of calls again there was a huge spike we want to take you through what we have experienced uh, he's already mentioned the general uh, categories uh, dennis has mentioned to you the categories where we provide assistance and as you may have seen or noticed all requirements are not related to abuse and violence. Many, many requirements are related to distress, pure distress, where there is no food, there may be a requirement for a certificate, a BPL certificate, there may be a requirement for emergency fees, 
to attend school. So there are many, many kind of suggestions, uh, many kind of uh, calls for assistance. In the pandemic time, what were, what were these cases which have remained? So these are just uh, symbolic of the kind of children who have called out or the adults who've called out on behalf of children uh, called uh, 1098 in the past 15 months. But these were the kind of children. Uh, Richa, who was not able to go home, or obviously all the names have been changed to maintain confidentiality. Uh, she is not able to return home and she had no food to eat. There were there were siblings who there were there were children who had gone out to play or gone out to meet friends and they were not able to get back like Richa. They were stuck in some other area because uh, you know the pandemic struck. They may have been spending the night at a school friend's house and then they were calling Childline because they wanted to get home. There were siblings uh, like Tiagu and Balaji who were walking and walking and walking for miles. I think all of us on television, on social media, in our neighborhoods, uh, those of us who live in cities, we've seen that terrible march home. We've all seen those uh, situations, those pictures of, uh, you know, those uh, uh, situations where people walked endlessly without, uh, without losing courage because they simply had to get home because they were so scared of what would happen if they remained where they were and because there was no support system where they were. So it was a combination of both things. We saw uh, situations where children were being sold for amounts, small amounts of money because families lost their livelihood and did not have enough to survive with. We saw situations where children were not able to go to school they were not able to access their friends, their peers. We saw adults who lost their jobs and uh, were isolated in their houses with children. We saw mental health being affected and we saw abuse and violence taking a form as a result of all these very many things that were happening. We saw also that because there was a lot of reverse migration, there were people walking back home, there were people losing their job. It was important when the lockdown started opening up, employers found it easier to employ children for less money and because they were desperate for some kind of earning for their families. So they, we saw a spike in child labor cases as lockdown started opening up, at least the reporting to us increased. We also saw a spike in uh, situations where of child marriage where, you know, uh, I think not just because child marriage does happen, but also because out of anxiety, there were a lot of marriages uh, being held and some of our teams uh, gave, you know, uh, situations where uh, families found it cheaper, more economical uh, to conduct marriages in this situation. And also because uh, the authorities were uh, preoccupied with the pandemic. So they thought they would use this opportunity. And many of these marriages might have been uh, preludes to trafficking, might have been preludes to say. We've been asked this question very often. Uh, did did uh, the pandemic result in a lot, of, lot more abuse and violence for children? It, it has not followed a similar pattern in terms of reporting to child life throughout the year. It has followed a very different pattern, which I will share with you. So earlier on in the year, in the first quarter, somebody asked us, we would say that, you know, we can't say because it's not as if calls reporting abuse and violence have suddenly shot up. We can only assume that because school children cannot access a phone, cannot access somebody to share their problem with, that may be the reason why they are not telling us. We expect that once the uh, pandemic, uh, once the lockdown opens up, children would be reaching out to us. And that is how it happened through the year. So as you can see from March to May, there was this constant one event after another we've tried to encapsulate, which resulted in a variety of, uh, you know, problems coming up. If there was, if there were two kinds of issues, which saw, a, 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 you know, a sharp focus, it was issues related to psychosocial uh, help, uh, where psychosocial help was required. It was issues related to uh, online safety. These were the these were the two categories where because children were spending so much of time online, there was di digital addiction. There was a you know a loss of uh, uh, opportunities of learning social skills. 
and also at the same time there was this uh, there was this anxiety there was this boredom there was this constant fear that they might lose a loved one or that they might never be able to go out again and these were the kind of uh, things that we were seeing even now we've given you a uh, encapsulated up to March 21, but even in the second wave, what has happened after that is that again, we've seen that, uh, you know, uh, though the focus of the entire country has been on those children who have lost one parent or both, what we've seen is that the same problems that started from last year have further, uh, you know, carried over, have spilled over and are continuing. And this time, the the entire uh, anxiety quotient, the entire you know, the amount of fear, it was it was increased hundredfold because people actually uh, the second wave affected almost you know somebody or the other either in your family or in your extended family, and this uh, fear really hit children very hard. This coupled with the fact that at least last year there was this constant thought that. Now schools will reopen. Now things will become better. But by the time we reach the second wave, we realize that we will have to learn rather to live with COVID. There is not going to be a situation where we can go back to what was there pre-15 months ago. We can go back to that. There is a situation where we have to learn to live with this and protect ourselves better. And children suffered that impact. So this is the number of calls we've uh, answered. There are more than 50 lakh calls answered uh, last year up to March. There were more than almost 4 lakh children who were assisted. When we give you these numbers, we are talking about those children who we have physically reached out to. So you have Childline teams throughout a pandemic who are not only picking up the phone to say, hello, Childline, how can I help you? But who are also where required walking that extra mile, negotiating with other stakeholders, because Childline doesn't do rescue alone. We can help with the school fees. We can help with the entitlement certificate. We can help with immediate emergency ration. But when it comes to rescue from abuse and exploitation, Childline always works with other stakeholders. So whether it's child labor or child marriage or abuse, there would be the police or the child marriage prohibition officer or the labor task force. We would have to take everybody along and this is this is the scenario that childline worked in a scenario of pandemic where it did not have the luxury of saying i can't go out it just had to go when a call when a child called childline had to respond so though we've seen a decrease uh, in in call volume we have seen that the decrease is more in you know the other categories of calls, uh, including the ones for information and referral. Whereas what we have seen is that the physical interventions where we have directly reached out to children, that increased by almost 14% if you compare with 1920. We're talking about last year. This is our uh, total a snapshot of our uh, calls and interventions. And as you can see, that um, it's more or less in terms of calls, except for the North, which has uh, many more calls uh, recorded. It's also a large piece with eight or nine, uh, eight states uh, under it. And uh, in terms of interventions, we see again, in total interventions, we see again, uh, parallel to the North, we have, uh, we have the North again leading in that area from we also see that in, in the first 10 days, there were about 5 lakh, uh, you know, there were about 5,000 interventions. And uh, in just those first 10 days uh, of the pandemic from when lockdown was announced. And after that, what, what I wanted to, what I pointed out earlier and I wanted to show you was, if you look at this, this is a graphical representation of our, not just our total interventions, interventions as if when we reached out to the child, the component within it, within it which related to interventions uh, connected with COVID-19. So I'm talking about the relief. I'm talking about food. I'm talking about shelter. I'm talking about medical. As you can see from April, May, June, again, you know, there is a fall when things got 
better and actually we became completely complacent which accounted for the second wave in uh, april may of the following in 2021 so this is how it was we again see that within our total interventions there is a category where which we talk about core child protection concerns which is protection from abuse and it is in this category that you will see starting from the beginning as i mentioned there was less reporting because children couldn't access anybody to report to but as we moved on that green line that you see on this graphical representation is your protection from abuse interventions which saw a sharp rise in reporting this as i mentioned earlier so we were looking at about uh, we gave you an average of about 15000 calls daily which was prior and in last year we've seen about uh, 13,706 calls daily being attended to and about more than a thousand children being helped, 1,069 being helped. In terms of, so if we look at the pandemic here, I think what, what is a difference for Childline is that uh, in this pandemic year, we see a large chunk of our direct interventions were related to COVID relief. So when we talk about COVID relief, we are talking about as I mentioned earlier, we are talking about dry rations, we are talking about food, we are talking about medical relief, we are talking about situations where children were ill, but people were scared just to take them to a doctor or to a hospital thinking they might be infected. Yeah. So we are talking about, uh, you know, situations where a child or a, fam uh, a family, a parent was stuck in another place and a child had to be helped because of COVID to reach a particular hospital or particular school or wherever just to you know get the immediate help required and this th these are the kind of cases which we categorized and covered about 41 percent of our total direct interventions in this situation as expected and where a large part of your uh, reverse migration also took place you have uttar pradesh madhya pradesh Odisha, bihar chhattisgarh where these COVID relief related interventions were carried out most. So these were the five top states. When you talk about child protection concerns, normally they are about 30%, 33% of our total interventions in any other year. But uh, in, in the last pandemic year, we're looking at 27% of total interventions being CP concerns, child protection concerns where the maximum number of child protection concerns were reported from South Zone. Now that for us as child protection practitioners is no indicator of the fact that there are more, you know, events of that kind happening in the South Zone. We feel it's because the coverage by Childline and the awareness about 1098 is much higher in the South Zone, which is why we get a lot more uh, cases related to core child protection concerns reported from the South. And as you can see, we are looking at one in, one in four cases were child marriage cases, one in five were child labor, and one in six were physical abuse. This shifted a little bit in the second, during the second wave, where you're looking at, uh, you know, the physical abuse rising. So you can see the frustration, uh, you know, amongst uh, families as uh, the pandemic just didn't, just didn't go away. COVID didn't go away and the second wave struck. And then not only was it COVID that you were dealing with, but it was a complete inadequacy of resources in the system. There was no response. There was no availability. So you could, uh, you could uh, survive COVID, but you may not survive uh, you know, the after effects of COVID because of the fact that there was no medical or medicines or doctors or hospital beds or oxygen available. So these were the kind of situations that we saw in April and May where the frustration in families, the mental health issues, the impact of that trauma, uh, you know, saw, played itself out in, in various kinds of situations of abuse and exploitation where children were concerned. And as you can see, child labor, again, that became reported a little less, whereas physical abuse became reported a little more. Again, uh, the, it was the South which was reporting about 42% compared to 40% earlier. It was reporting about 42%. And, and again, 43% uh, of our total interventions in April, May, June were related to COVID relief because that was the need of the hour. 
very often we are asked uh, what is the impact of child life yeah so our job is to make sure that a child is safe our job is to rescue a child from an unsafe situation and for us that definition of being unsafe is not just if you are being abused and exploited it can be because you are in such a vulnerable situation that if you are not helped then if that critical emergency help is not provided you will fall into a cycle of abuse and exploitation so that's how we view it in childline and that is why we started this presentation with that saying that for us a violation of any right uh, is child abuse any right not just when a sexual abuse is taking place but any right of a child to survival to development to health to participation to protection if it is violated for us that is abuse and that is how child line is helped so if you look at our impact uh, in the last uh, one year in pandemic year you're looking at uh, various you know numbers of uh, children rescued from marriage from child labor from physical abuse you're looking at uh, you're looking at children in conflict with law being assisted and rehabilitated in all in the last uh, one year you you're looking at children being helped with shelter children being restored to their families which we mentioned earlier you're looking at children who were missing or lost and in most of these cases we are actually also helping parents because nobody takes their firs so there's a huge connection between as we see it between missing children and trafficking and child labor and all of it that entire circle is connected so we are helping parents to lodge firs ensure that the legal process starts we are also looking at as we mentioned earlier the assistance under covid the pandemic and the medical help and other things one very important category uh, which we call emotional support and guidance actually manifested in various ways uh, during uh, this pandemic when we realized that our skills and our requirements to provide emotional support and guidance were far more during an emergency and critical situation like pandemic and uh, we worked very hard to improve those and and are on a, a journey of further enhancing those so that we can provide that psychosocial support to children what did we do apart from picking up the phone which took a humongous amount of effort as i called it 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 was a war room cif and the partner network were all transformed into war rooms so we had to immediately change because we work with standard scripts when calls land so we had to change those scripts incorporate uh, information about covid helpline numbers advisories issued by governments at national and state levels so that people could you know access that information and understand what was going on because the panic was huge then there was there were challenges related to mobility you know whether it was to rescue a child from child marriage and you needed a vehicle or transport for that in more, in many cases the police were most helpful in fact and worked very closely with childline but apart from that it was also mobility to reach uh you know your child line contact center to pick up the phone it was it was as he mentioned uh, we had colleagues ferrying uh, ccos from the ccc to home we had uh, challenges related to food we had challenges related to personal safety fear and discrimination oh so you going out to work so if you're staying in a hostel that means you're coming back with the virus so you cannot stay here these were the kind of situations that you know child line dealt with in various ways uh, throughout the pandemic year we created because of that because this whole uh, you know there are these two sides like as a helpline as a caregiving uh, body we have to our focus has always been on children the pandemic forced us to understand that even with children it's not just safety it's the mental health it's the psychosocial support which is imperative and the pandemic forced us to acknowledge that if we don't look after ourselves and if we don't look after our teammates the caregivers themselves the child line network the teams if we don't look after their anxieties and fears then there's no way that they will be able to help children properly 
So these were the two areas I think that you know we uh, were forced to look at and we saw it as an opportunity and we learned from it. So we also created uh, as a result of the pandemic, there were many things which were happening face to face prior to that. Whether it's training, whether it's reporting a case, people landing up at you know, a partner's office and reporting a case and so on. We wanted to facilitate that if somebody cannot go out, if a child can't speak to someone, can't pick up a phone, but has access to some digital medium because of school and other things, let us create a system whereby they can report a case even online. So we reported all this apart from the resources on COVID. There were e-letters e being continuously shared where successes, uh, you know, the, the impact that teams were making on the ground was shared back again with general public and with the team so that they would feel recognized, that their efforts would be recognized uh, by, you know, everybody around. We created WhatsApp messages. It was very important because lines were continuously busy. There was a high volume of abandoned calls because there were so many calls. Say, for instance, in the first 10 days when I told you that there was a huge spike, so many calls coming in. We had to circulate videos, WhatsApp messages to tell people that Chiline is not locked down. Then we were receiving calls plateaued. So we were receiving fewer calls from children related to abuse and exploitation. So we, in 22 languages, we were continuously spending, spreading the message that you can talk to us. If you want, we are there and we will try and help you in whatever way possible. Also, because it was so important to keep the network and the team, uh, the morale of the team, you know, high, we created national campaigns. Relief work I've already mentioned a lot about, but it involved all this. It involved, so I'll give you an example. A railway child line, which could not work on the railway station, was distributing food and rations and joining hands with district child line in the area around the railway station. You had people, you had all child line teams working with their state and district administrations, providing packed food, rations, sanitizers, soaps, everything, every resource that was possibly needed by, you know, whether it was a laborer walking back home, whether it was a family where a child was very sick, whether it was, a, it was you know, another uh, uh, colleague who needed that help, whose own family was, you know, or child was badly affected. So there was, there was this entire uh, spectrum of people who we were helping, not just by providing something, but also by linking to other providers. I think that is a critical role which Childline plays continuously, even in other times. And I think this was a this network that we have with other stakeholders, state and district administration, which is already existing. I think this network was really galvanized. And this was one year where Childline worked on its credo and made it work that child protection is everybody's business. So I think we there was not a single stakeholder we didn't reach out to, we didn't, uh, you know, talk to for the protection and uh, best interest of the child. Apart from this, as I said, we used it as an opportunity. So when we used it as an opportunity, what we did was we shifted everything online. So we had uh, most of our trainings were rare or they were in small teams or they were ad hoc because resources are few. The pandemic forced us to go online and thereby helped us to integrate capacity building of the network and our personnel, you know, into the program. So training became a regular activity in Childline because training online required us to prepare materials and skills, but did not require money. So we worked very hard in, you know, training our uh, creating e-resources, creating a learning management system and also creating things like a psychosocial support manual where uh, these were the e-resources created. And apart from that, we called in experts on uh, disaster management, on psychosocial support, on uh, communication with children, on uh, advocacy with stakeholders, and the entire network was trained on these aspects. This is a strategy which is going to continue even as we move forward uh, with uh, living with COVID and dealing with it. Um, a lot of child lines 
including creating a learning management system where now Childline team members will be able to access courses or modules on their own and even learn, uh, you know, by themselves without having to go through a training session. So we are creating the situation where we'll be able to help uh, our uh, network in the best way possible through the online medium. I would really like to draw your attention to one thing, which is, I mean, kudos. And um, I cannot stop saying this, but a thousand salams to those childline workers on the ground who not only responded when a call for help came, but walked out every single day, say for instance, from October. So apart from the time when there was lockdown and where you know the focus was on providing help to a child when a call came in. Uh, when the lockdown started opening up, you had childline teams walking out in their areas, mapping areas, mapping vulnerable spots, spreading awareness about, you know, how to sanitize, how to keep distance, how to wear a mask, and distributing material as well. This kind of an outreach that childline conducted uh, resulted in more than, you can see, almost 2 lakh activities, outreach activities between October and March when the lockdown was considerably re reduced or opened up. And you had in that period over 30 lakh children and over 44 lakh adults reached in those six months. So here was a team which was going out in with its PPEs, with its masks, only to help a larger uh, you know, society, or to help a larger community to be more safe. And they did it and dealt with their own fears and anxieties while they were performing these tasks. So kudos to them for that. There are some, here are some um, pictures which I think are self-explanatory of the kind of relief and awareness work that was uh, done during this time. This is uh, again a snapshot of how you can report a case online in Childline. And uh, not only were they doing outreach work, but also the open house that Dennis referred to, how can Childline work? How can it learn if it doesn't engage with children? So even during this pandemic, what happened was that uh, Childline units on the ground with helps from the program teams in regional resource centers were creating innovative ways and methods of engaging with children. Children in CCIs with online games, online contests, online classes. Uh, children were being supported through videos being made and circulated on various aspects uh, related to bullying, related to, you know, you don't have to feel scared, related to providing awareness on COVID. So there was uh, there was this huge attempt from the network and from Childline 1098 to reach out to children wherever they are in whichever way possible, especially as, uh, you know, the uh, we learned how to function more effectively online. Again, this, these were the various kinds of campaigns launched. This was a newsletter that I mentioned. These were the motivational national campaigns where we genuinely felt with or without the campaign, we lost colleagues in the network uh, to COVID. We have lost a number of family members. For us, Childline is a special family. It's an extended family. So uh, the constant effort has been to stand with each other as we move forward in this period of anxiety. What can, what do we need? What were our challenges? Or oh, what did we get? What did we do? There were, there were several things from basic, uh, you know, personal safety material where agencies like UNICEF helped us to, uh, you know, the fact that uh, we had, as I mentioned, the police so cooperating so much in terms of providing vehicular support when we had to be mobile and reach a child. Uh, we had uh, these three or four categories of challenges. One was related to personal safety. The other was related to logistics, whether it was travel or food. The third was, of course, related to human resource, you know, where you have people who not only had to deal with other people's problems and their anxieties, but had to deal with their own anxieties and their own problems as their families were affected or their families were scared. 
So there were simple things we wanted. We wanted the child and 1098 should be an essential service. It should be declared as, as such, which some state governments did help us with uh, in during the pandemic year, like in Bihar or in West Bengal. And this helped mobility. So we wanted that, you know, there should be regular testing for child line teams. And I think a lot of uh, state governments, especially during the second wave, have even helped with vaccination, which has been a huge, uh, you know, it's given a lot of uh, confidence to the teams as they move out. We have tried uh, to organize for insurance cover for child line. But what we still need is to build more capacities of child line on how to handle disasters on how to look at child protection in emergencies. And that still remains. It's our uh, agenda for this year as we move forward to create e-resources on that. What do we think can help a child more? See, we've seen these isolation centers. We've seen quarantine centers. We've seen a lot of structures coming up. We've seen state governments moving, up, uh, moving forward with compensation schemes. Uh, what we as Childline feel is that all these spaces being created for children, whether it's quarantine centers or, uh, you know, it's an isolation center or whatever you want to name it or call it, all these need to have child protection policies uh, in for these centers so that no child is vulnerable there to abuse. Any district level task force, which is dealing, uh, which is trying to prepare or prevent disaster should include 1098 personnel. There are 1098 teams in over uh, in almost 600 districts in the country. The representative should be there so that a child's interest is looked after. We, uh, you know, with the large NCC and the large NSS network that uh, uh, your uh, CCDRR and uh, NITM could reach out to, you you could talk to. Uh, we 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 would look at youth uh, groups. We would look at youth networks to spread the message of 1098. And also to be eyes and ears, you know, of community as they move around to talk about child protection and child rights and to, you know, just basically sensitize people so that issues such as child marriage or child labor, which have a source in mindset that can be challenged and addressed. So these youth groups can really help us to spread that awareness and also provide assistance to a child. This was the message for them that you volunteer in an organized way. If you have an NSS unit in your college, make this an agenda, reach out to Childline. We will connect you with an, uh, you know, the local unit and you could work with them. If children cannot be, cannot go to school or if children cannot, uh, you know, uh, have access to anybody from outside the family, what about online mechanisms of providing them uh, knowledge of providing, say, for instance, supplementary education, tuition, you know, doing workshops with them. Young people can come up with so many, so many innovative ideas and they could work with Childline teams and be volunteers and provide this kind of help. They could also help us to map vulnerable areas, you know, in, in, uh, in a very uh, designed and systematic way, work with the local Childline teams to help us to uh, do this. They can help us to uh, create campaigns. Uh, so we know that youth groups are uh, with their uh, acumen for social media, with the with their you know command over social media. Young people use social media far more often than uh, many of us do. So they could actually design campaigns for us and help us. So there are there are a variety of ways in which you know the large NSS and NCC network could actually create make this a part of their work and move forward. All we can say is as we as we close uh, today's session, at least our part of it is that um, as Dennis mentioned earlier, we strongly believe in that we need to collaborate. We need to connect. We need to catalyze. Yes, and uh, you know, we need to communicate. So we need child protection to be everybody's business. That is our only aim as a uh, child line 1098 in India. And we hope that we will have the support of this larger community in making child protection everybody's business.
reach us here. You can contact us. Thank you. I'll need to stop sharing and that I have to figure out how to do so. I'll take care of it, ma'am. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, Halin, ma'am, and thank you sir, for such a very nice uh, presentation. And we could able to understand the entire process of uh, how the child helpline functions and the very valuable work which you have done during this COVID-19 pandemic for protecting children. And uh, the last slide, which is very much useful to all the participants, and they could able to do something for the protection of children uh, as part of uh, their uh, social service or connecting with the field. So really, I very happy to listen to both the presentations and uh, really it was very useful and we could able to understand the thing. So let me now let us move on to the question answer session. Now I may invite uh, Professor Sahaya ma'am to read out the questions in the chat box. Okay, before uh, I start uh, reading of the question, I want to express a word of, ex uh, in fact, it's a gratitude and appreciation for the service that Silent Foundation is doing. It's very great, sir, Dennis, sir, and uh, ma'am. Uh, I think I was wonderstruck by the services that you give. So being a professor in the social work, I think uh, you can be the resource person for, uh, to address our college. Because uh, to tell you, we have a child line in uh, Vijayawada, Krishna district, which is extremely active, extremely active. I have appreciation for them. So thanks for all this uh, organizers. As panelists, we listen. I think it's also a chance for us to learn. So we keep learning. Thank you so much. So the first question that is posted here is, ma'am, uh, any of you can answer. Uh, where do we go from here? I think it's gone up. One minute, ma'am. I think it was that with so many variants. Where do we go from here? Uh, we... Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Uh, one person just gave an information just to say to tell you thank you for all that okay where do we have a number of children i mean to say uh, do we have a number of children traffic married off or number of self-harm inflicted upon themselves due to stress conditions have you come across these cases ma'am yes yes of course i think uh... I mentioned in my presentation also in the in the slide on impact that there have been so many number of you know uh, child marriages prevented or uh, child labor uh, situations where rescue has been done or uh, even children. I I'm not uh, I I'm not aware of any self harm uh, already inflicted, but definitely situations where a child was capable of uh, harming him or herself. And before that, uh, you know, we were informed. So emotional support and guidance was given. I think those kind of cases we have seen as of uh, last year. Yes. Uh, when you talk about numbers, uh, <laughs> I do not think what we have is uh, numbers related to calls which have come to us. So as child protection practitioners, I, I have my colleague uh, Chitrakala Acharya also on call. Dennis is there, Dr. Jaya is there. As child protection practitioners, we never say that every single child who is vulnerable or who is affected has called 1098. In fact, our, our, uh, our uh, what should I say, our struggle is that we uh, reach as many children as possible. Because we believe that what comes to us is just the tip of the iceberg. We do believe that there may be many other uh, children who are also affected by these issues. And they have not reached uh, 1090, but we do get these issues reported to us. Okay. Ma'am, uh, as it stands, I'm not seeing the cases here. Uh, I mean, I'm not seeing the questions here. But okay, can I, can, I, can I read them out? Because I can see some questions. So if you, you want. Can see, ma'am, ma one minute, one minute. Is okay. there any arrangement in local uh, police stations? Regarding child help in any needful situations, because uh, police stations cover the whole areas very well. So the question is: uh, as, Is there any child can be helped in a police station? 
So uh, as per the Juvenile Justice Act, you are supposed to have child welfare officers uh, in police stations. You have a police officer who is designated as a child welfare officer, and they are supposed to help uh, children in need of care and protection. Um, in terms of arrangement, I'm not sure because, uh, as I mentioned earlier during my slides, we do not assist a child affected by abuse and violence on our own. The first thing that 1098 would do after transferring the call locally is talk to the local police. So any rescue that is done is done as a coordinated effort with the police. And uh, police also understands that, you know, with their, uh, with so many of their uh, you know, concurrent responsibilities, they also need civil society, which is trained. They need NGOs or they need, uh, you know, uh, social workers who are trained in handling children to actually give the care and support in situations. So everybody in the system works together to help the children. So in terms of a desk within uh, within police stations for child health, there's, a, there's an inspector. There are some child friendly police stations created where they also have especially done up rooms and uh, you know where a child can be kept after being rescued before being placed before CWC. But uh, those are not across the country. Now the next question is, uh, what are the facilities are available in helpline centers for disability and mentally retired children who are taking care of them till they reach their parents? So. I, as I mentioned also, and as Dennis also mentioned, our job is if, if a child, uh, our job is to help all children. So there are no specific facilities created in childline centers to deal with any one particular kind of child. The, the facility has to be child friendly is what we say. And that is how it is maintained because our job is temporary. It is to reach the child, provide emergency assistance and bring the child within the juvenile justice system. If the child is a child in need of care and protection and in that situation, the CWC will tell you what kind of help has to be given for a child who is affected by uh, disability and, or otherwise. What we do get are cases where they want the disability certificates is not possible because they don't get any benefits if they don't have that. We help them with that under the you know, there was a, in our slide, there was a, a section called entitlements. So we help them get those certificates as, as well. What we also do is sometimes they need uh, uh, referral services. They need more help and they don't have information. So we connect them with organizations or with hospitals or, uh, you know, medical practitioners or special educators. We connect them with those people who can help a child who has a mental or physical, uh, mental, who is mentally or physically challenged. That's what we do. Chitra, you can add on, Chitra and Dennis, if I've missed out on anything, please do interrupt and add on. Mm -hmm. Chitra, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Um, yes, I think. The, as far as the chat is concerned, uh, yeah, I question is not. Is it audible now? Yeah, you're, you're audible now, Chitra. Yeah, I think Arlene uh, has uh, covered most of the things because we work. One of our credo is we don't work alone. And uh, we link them up with existing resources that are there within the purview of the legislations that will apply to the situation in which the child has been found. So even if a child with uh, disability, so Whatever resources are available, we link them out. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there's a problem. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am, for adding to this. Thanks for your answer, ma'am. Um, uh, as I see in the chat box, there are no other questions. I think some parts uh, can still ask you. Uh, let me see, ma'am. There are some questions in the beginning. I request Chitra, ma'am, kindly mute your mic, please. Uh, uh, I think some participants are having some doubt uh, why this helpline is limited to city. So please make it clear, ma'am. No, it's not. That's that's uh, that's a uh, that's that's an erroneous notion. It's not at all limited uh, to cities. Uh, if uh, I could 
take you back to the slide which uh, Dennis had presented where he spoke about the child line model. Uh, so you have uh, you have a intervention unit at district level, but you also have uh, in a area which is primarily rural, you have what we call sub centers, which are at block level. And uh, the structures available, so three to five sub centers can exist depending on the size of the district. And what we uh, did share at that point of time was that these are the arms of the intervention unit. So they extend your coverage. But the, uh, the work of the sub center is not just case uh, response, it's also outreach so that you can prevent abuse and exploitation from happening. You can reach out, you know, at block level, at village level. And I think uh, one role that is becoming critical for Childline as we move forward is if we are present in 600 districts, if not cities, right? So if we are present in 600 districts, then uh, we should be able to work in those 600 districts to catalyze, which is our credo again, the village level child protection committees, the block level child protection committees, which exist in many places but are not functional. So we need to work with them, help them with their capacities so that wherever we can't reach, because there's a limitation in terms of size of the unit and you know how many sub centers you can have. So wherever child line can't reach, the VLCPCs and the VLCPCs, they will help in preventing abuse and exploitation. That's the plan. So definitely not a city based model that old information. That is how it was in 2000 when it started. Not any longer. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That, uh, anyone can call from anywhere by using a mobile phone or even if you, if you're not having a, like a recharge, if you're not having enough balance in your mobile, also you can call it's a free call, right? Ma'am, it's, it's a toll, toll free, free. Toll yes. free. Yes. free number. Yes. So anybody can call from anywhere 24 into 7. So that we need to understand. Uh, yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. There is one more question, please. Uh, Sahaya, ma'am, to be able to see. Uh, one minute. I'm not able to see. Uh, it's okay, ma'am. Otherwise, I can help you. Yeah, yeah. You can read. I can't see here. Uh, it's, it's okay. Comment. <laughs> uh, there is a that... comment actually. Yes, ma'am. But it's a question. I think. Whether there are any facilities provided by CWC for dropout children to continue their education by education. So what kind of support is being um, given by? Uh, so actually uh, CWC, you're referring to the child welfare committee within the juvenile justice system. Uh, if the child is brought before the CWC, the CWC would also be connecting the child to a shelter home or to a government scheme where sponsorship is being provided. There is sponsorship available under the scheme, which the CWC is uh, also a part of the committee which decides on who gets sponsorship, and that is primarily for education. So if the child is brought before CWC, that will happen. Childline also, if they find children in, uh, you know, families when they do outreach, as uh, we described earlier, will not only provide that emergency fee to begin with, but will connect the child with the sponsorship and for, you know, the uh, uh, foster care committee will get a people committee will connect with the CWC so that the child can get that help to continue their education. The only difficulty is, and there are private players also who are providing, uh, you know, help and support for sponsorship. Only difficulty in the sponsorship under the government system currently is that it's limited to a certain budget and a certain number of children. So it gets reduced. However, uh, in my understanding, a lot of the budget for sponsorship actually goes unutilized. So I think it's probably because the children are not connected with the CWC effectively. The child line does that. We try to connect them so that they don't have to drop off. There was a comment, uh, Dr. Balu, earlier where by Manindra Ji, which I think is an extremely relevant. Rescue your child, we put him in shelter, but instead of giving uh, some education or physical and uh, right knowledge, we simply rescue and return back to the family members where they again back to the ch anti child activities. Is a comment 
Yeah, it's a comment which is very relevant because uh, a lot of times and we saw during the pandemic as well because of the fear and anxiety, there was a move at one point of time to send children back home. Uh, sometimes as uh, people in uh, who are working in a community, all of us, we are all related to community uh, you know, protection in some way or the other. I think we need to understand that if a child has, uh, you know, come out of family or is found outside the safety net or is found within the juvenile justice system, there must have been reasons why the child has, uh, you know, been found there. So simply not addressing the reasons and sending the child back to family may not be the best solution possible. And in to that extent, uh, our experience uh, in this field also supports that. It's not that the family is not the best place for the child. We are not arguing with that. But a loving and caring family is the best place for the child. Many times a family is handicapped for various reasons, which can be simply ignorance. Nothing more than that. It's not always poverty. So uh, there is a requirement to assess that situation instead of just sending, restoring the child back to family. Just assess the situation, help the family so that the child doesn't have to fall again into some kind of unprotected situation. And he's right. Manindraji is right in that observation. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sahayam, Halindam, and uh, Deepa for uh, elaborately answering all the question answer questions. And uh, really, it was a very fruitful session and also knowledge orientation to all the participants and even to me also. So uh, I think uh, we are on time now. We have uh, two more minutes. Uh, and uh, so let us move with if uh, Tenim, sir, would you like to add any point here or the principal, ma'am? <laughs> Anybody would you like to speak final words? Okay, so uh, now I may invite uh, uh, Chitra ma'am for formal delivery in your vote of thanks. Over to you, Chitra ma'am. Yeah, thank you very thank much, uh, Dr. Balu. Am I audible? Yes, Chitra. Okay, so I think today's webinar, I see it as a great opportunity and platform for Childline to once again bring back the focus of child protection uh, you know, with the student community and the academia. So we have, and I think uh, it's been a great uh, collaboration between the NIDM, the College of Social Work and uh, Child and India Foundation, because uh, I see a lot of parallels between uh, NIDM and uh, Child Line in a way, because uh, in any disaster, uh, emergency response is what our first calling is. So like child line responds to any child who is in a difficult situation, I'm sure NIDM, the National Institute, the National Disaster Management Authority also in, in many ways is um, responsible and takes up the mandate of, of uh, looking at ever evolving needs, concerns and uh, grievances of the community and society at large. So uh, also this being a certification, uh, uh, you know, partic certificate of participation, uh, I'm sure would have been a great incentive for a lot of students to join in and, uh, you know, learn more about child protection. And as uh, Harleen said, uh, we, are, we are very keen and we have seen a lot of positive response from young adolescents, college students, uh, who are very interested in child protection, they may not have the wherewithal and they may not know exactly how to proceed to help. But there certainly is a good will at heart which wants to reach out and help. So I, I hope and I'm sure today's session where a lot of illustrations of how children have been impacted and how uh, the existing mechanisms which includes child line as an emergency response and various um, government entities, com uh, the competent authorities are uh, have have really responded so positively. So I think uh, I would like to thank the organizers, um, the NIDM, the College of Social Work, my colleagues here, for um, you know this wonderful experience that has been made available to the students, to the faculty, to all the. Uh, 
many of our tagline network partners are also um, here so i'm happy that uh, this experience has been made available to them and we hope uh, you know we'll see a lot more uh, proactive engagement of students coming forward to join us in this uh, in this mission because uh, in whatever capacity they the, where there is a will there's a way they say and uh, if they do come forward we at chailand would be happy to find out a way to see how their their energies their talents and their emotions you know all these put together can can bring out the best and uh, give the best to children so thank you very much and uh, i hand it over back to dr balu to close the webinar thank you very much thank you ma'am so once again on behalf of uh, national institute of disaster management ccdr center i extend my sincere gratitude to childland uh, india foundation for collaborating with us and sharing your experience and also for creating awareness among the volunteers and i also extend my sincere gratitude to the uh, mary stella college uh, for uh, joining hands with us in the field of protecting children from the pandemic so i thank uh, two eminent speakers with us who has given a wonderful presentation today Uh, once again, thank you so much to each and everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Looking forward to collaborate with you in future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Balu sir, thank you so much. Uh, you have taken a lot of trouble, thank sir. Thank you, ma'am. You have taken a lot of trouble. Well organized. Very good resource persons. I know it. So salute to you, sir. <laughs> thank. You. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. It's all with all your cooperation. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Balu. Well done. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Balu. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you. Thank you.